So in this video, we have a special guest. His name is Elias. He is currently a senior staff solution architect at Sense. And before that, he was a Amazon uh, AWS senior solution architect. So Elias, welcome to this channel. Hi, Eric. Thank you very much for having me. Awesome. So Elias, could you tell us a bit more about who you are? Sure. Uh, Elias Bakush, uh, uh, senior staff solutions architect, uh, which basically means I work with multiple stakeholders and try to build solutions, right, for them. Um, we can, I guess we will be getting into this a little bit in yep. details about the roles and stuff like that. Um, but um, I'm based right now in Montreal, Canada. Um, here, I've been in Montreal for six, seven years. Before I was in France for six, seven years. And then before that, I uh, I was born and raised in Morocco. And so, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Nice, nice. Very interesting. Now, my first question uh, for you is, you know, your career journey um, uh, from, you know, when you graduate from school all the way to where you are now. Can you tell us brief briefly about, you know, what have you encountered so far with your career journey? Definitely. I, point. So I, I got my master's in distributed systems a long time ago, maybe that was 2009 or 2010 in Paris. And then I wanted to teach, you know, so that was my career aspiration at that point. I wanted to become a teacher, a professor. And so I had to do a second master's degree because at that time if you wanted to teach you needed so in France there's two type of masters it's either professional master's degree that you take in order to work um, join companies and stuff like that and then there's a research master's degree that you need to take in order to do to join academia so I had to do a different one just for the sake of joining academia after that and, and my second master's degree was in theoretical computer science um, it was it was really interesting it was really an interesting thing I've learned a lot of things but I learned a lot about why did we come up, for example, with the for loop and, and the while loop and what's the mathematical thesis behind it and why at some point, uh, why do we have only three uh, programming types? You know, there's functional programming, there's object-oriented programming, and there's the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the sequential? No, what do you call the sequential programming? I don't know, I forgot its name. And, and why we only have three, for example, and why we can never probably have a, so there's a lot of, I, I, I spent a lot of time learning about all the theory behind computer science before I was like, well, you know what, now that I know all these things, I think that I like better to build stuff. And so I joined my first role was a web developer in Paris at a company who used to build software for with, you know, you know, what we used to do is what you would call right now sentiment analysis. And we used to, it just, we didn't call it machine learning, but we used to use a lot of algorithms so we had like to index the web the way google does it yeah but we applied some machine learning algorithms on top of it and try to extract in important information and build dashboards for personalities uh, like famous people like politicians so they would come to our dashboard and they they would know what people say about them and then what uh what's the uh, is it a negative thing is it a positive thing are people excited and then we want we were even indexing stuff that goes on TV, like the news and, and shows that go on TV. I said, that was that was like a long time ago. That was super exciting. And then, uh, you know, with time, I learned a lot of a lot of new technologies, a lot of programming languages, a lot of paradigms, again, experience. So I became a full stack developer. And then uh, that's actually when I joined, when I left France and then I came to Canada. And then from, from you know, I joined also, uh, I have always liked to work with startups. I always, for some reason, I don't know, maybe it's because it's easier to get work done. You know, you don't get lost in the bureaucracy of big companies and, and, and things like that or maybe maybe I was just too young I don't know I just I just like to <laughs> jump on things and solve problems right away and um, yeah so I, I was I was a team lead uh, I was a technical lead and I was a team lead uh, then at some point I joined a company called motivate which are you know if, if probably your viewers uh, have already seen bike sharing programs in you know all over the world so whether you're in New York mm -hmm. or in Chicago or whatever there's bike shares and motivate basically, I don't want to say owns, but motivates, handles, and manages the majority of these bike sharing programs in the whole world, right? Worldwide. There's customers in Dubai, in Paris, and whatever. And so at that point, I decided to give like just a, a, a try a new thing and became a manager, a team manager. And I thought that, okay, so far I have been 
uh, technical my whole career. So right now I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to learn or I want to, I want to try this people thing or this business thing. So I was a manager, web team manager, and we did some pretty great things there. Uh, that was probably my first real professional experience on a big scale around microservices and around how they, how to build them and how they scale on orchestration uh, and stuff like that. And, uh, and, and that gave me, uh, I would say a lot of expertise and a lot of experience dealing with business stakeholders and getting requirements. And so not only building software and getting requirements already like delivered in a, in a plate and, and just conversing them or converting them into code, but I was taking that step upfront, upstream and thinking about these requirements and, and, and like all these non-functional requirements, right. And, and, and what the business and the business vision and, uh, and the realities of the business and the challenges and why do our customers like this thing and what kind of feedback do they give us? And so I was able to get that and, and mix it with my technical background. And after that, mm. you know, that, that opens up a whole door uh, for me. And, and, and that when I was started looking at solutions architecture, and that's when, you know, that, that's again, a whole chapter in my life and uh, something I've been doing for the past five, six years. And I really like very much. Yeah, yeah, we're going to dive deep into, you know, why you made the transition. Um, but one question that I want to, you know, finish off. So, so you, so when you were uh, a team manager, so you were also managing on the product side of things, like you also had to gather business requirement, or are you only specifically managing the technical side, like the, the software developers or and such? Yeah, it was both. Um, I, when I joined, it was just to manage the team, right? And, uh, you know, pretty much the people aspect of the business and, and, and these guy when I go on vacation and this other guy need to work on this sprint and you know and and, and and those kind of things but then the role evolved and I found myself talking directly with our state business stakeholders and managing that product aspects of it so by the end of it I was pretty much doing both of them gotcha gotcha awesome and I also noticed that you were a full stack developer at sense in the past in 2014 yes <laughs> and then you came back currently at uh, sense as a staff software engineer oh sorry staff solution architect well like what attracted you um, about this company that you want to go back there again? Good question. So Essence, when I when I joined Essence, it was at the beginning, and I was part of the team that built that built the the version one point zero. I would say the version one point two or one point three. And and I saw the the the, uh, the I, I loved the vision. You know, I I, I loved how Essence approaches um, their customers, how they care about their customers. I loved also the fact that Essence was an early adopter in a world where a lot of companies are afraid of jumping on the new thing. Essence, even six or seven years ago, they were the first to adopt uh, microservices, for example. They were the first to use uh, a Kubernetes when Kubernetes was feared and it's still feared. Uh, and and, and they, they have this approach of, they have this, this way of, of really using the right tools for the right job and using technology not as a fi like a finality, I don't know, like finality, how do you say it? Like a final thing, like a goal. They mm -hmm. would use technology just, you know, as a tool to reach their goal. And they don't, and the, the company's culture around technology was built in a way that developers or engineers don't get really attached to a technology. And this is something I've seen a lot of times, especially when I was working at AWS and I was interacting with a lot of customers. You would see some companies who define themselves by a technology. They say, well, we are a Windows shop or we are a .NET shop or we are a Node.js shop. And, and that's pretty much what we use to solve our problems. And at some point you find yourself, you know, trying to, to uh, get a circle within, you know, a, a box that is a triangle or something like that. But, but but Essence culture from the beginning was that we're going to use this technology to solve this specific problem. And then there's no ego there. That's not mine. That's not, you know, if in a couple of years we need something else, we'll, we'll, we'll use something else. And so I, I, I left Essence when I felt that my job was done, that I was able to deliver uh, what I promised to deliver when I joined them. And then I did this whole 360 degrees uh, working in multiple customers in, uh, in multiple companies in Montreal. And I joined AWS. And when I joined AWS, I got assigned Canada East Territory. So I was working with pretty much ISVs, independent software vendors in Canada East and uh, DNBs, digital native businesses. And funny enough, mm -hmm. Essence became my customer. <laughs> like 
they they became a company that I that I was working with every day. Uh, that I was advising, that I was joining the strategic decisions, that I was helping solve uh, problems, and so I knew more about how the company grew and uh, and about their challenges, uh, the challenges that they're looking for going ahead. And so when I was looking at a change after AWS, I was like, well, you know, there's this uh, a company that I that I like, and and why not? And so yeah, I gave it a try and found myself. See, like Montreal is really small when you look at it at the, from this perspective. Every time. I leave a company, I'm sure I'm going to work with the same people in a different company in like two or three years <laughs> or four years. It's There's only so many companies that are worth, I would say, the effort and, they, and that they do things the right way. So you end up meeting the same people here and there, um, which is something pretty pretty cool. And, and you learn a couple of things here and there. You know, you learn not to burn bridges, you know, you know, you know the, the importance of making friends rather than enemies, because you know that... <laughs> You're gonna meet the same people in a yeah. couple of years, so yeah. you're not, you know, you, you, it's not like once you change a company, you're starting from scratch. Yeah, got that's, it. Got that's it. That's pretty yeah, much that's it. very interesting. Mm, got it. Uh, so my next question for you is responsibility. So could you um, maybe tell us a bit more about, you know, uh, what's your responsibility as a solution architect? You know, for those people who don't know what's a solution architect, uh, what does a solution architecture do? Great question. Let's, yeah, let's let's take a step back. What is architecture, or or why we do architecture? And, and I believe software architecture in general has multiple goals, but the main goal is to do things the right way, is to do things right, is to build software right. And how you build software right is by, well, learning from experience, learning from mistakes, um, um, learning from other people's mistakes, following best practices and stuff like that, but also like you shouldn't I, I I see something that a lot of engineers do software engineers do is they focus a lot on the engineering aspects of software engineering and they try to come up with the best engineering solution but at the end of the day there are a lot of realities around that business you don't you know you don't work in a bubble and so when you're building a solution yes you need it to follow best practices and you need to be maintainable and you need it to be uh, 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 fast and, and performance and and, and and all these things but also you want to be able to build a solution that translates easily business requirements to a feature, right? At, at the core, I believe that at its core, I believe that building, you know, a solution that, that works, that's super easy. Anyone right now can just do NPM, install something, and then you got a package or use a framework or whatever, and you build something that works. But then build it, building something that can be scalable, right? And that can scale with traffic and highly available and, and secure, that's a little bit hard, but then building something that you can maintain for five years or building something, building a, a workload, an application that you can maintain for 10 years, that's the hardest thing in software engineering. And that's where architecture becomes um, um, super important. And so uh, uh, for me, like so, uh, or architecture or solutions architecture actually is this ability of being the bridge between business requirements. So, so I spend a lot of time talking with products people, uh, with CEOs, with CTOs and understanding their vision. Where do you want to be in the next 10 years? And then I spend a lot of time talking with security people. And you know what? What are the, uh, I would say, for example, the compliances that we need to follow for our business? Uh, what is the uh, uh, red flags that you're looking for? What is the tools that you use? And then I spend a lot of time talking with engineers and developers and understanding their realities. What are the frameworks you're efficient with? What... Uh, languages, you know, how can you build your CI CD pipeline? Well, and I try to gather all these things before even taking a decision around architecture, before deciding that we're going to build this new uh, application or this new workload in this cloud using this database, using this design patterns, using this language. So the responsibilities are technical, you know, um, 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 like making sure that the architecture that was designed is being followed by technical folks, by engineers, by team leads, but also making sure that 
the business requirements are being followed as well and being well understood, right? Nothing is more frustrating than a business stakeholder asking, hey guys, can we, I want to add a button, a button at the top right of my website. And then the developers say, well, that's going to take five days to add it. Nothing is more frustrating than, than this because the question is, how did we get to a point where adding a button at the top right of the website gets, gets five days? Something Something must be wrong. <laughs> and that's that's where ar- you realize that architecture is highly, highly uh, uh, over. I would say like people forget about it until it's too late. You know, it's like unit tests. Everyone love unit tests, but then no one writes unit tests. Everyone says, oh yeah, we'll, we'll write them later once we uh, deploy version one. And then, you know, software is like, it's, it's like, it's like a rocket ship or it's like an airplane. Once you build things in this way, you can't change it after Afterwards, the airplane is is going. Sorry, is flying, and you're within it. You can't change the way the wing is designed while the airplane is flying. It's just you just can't do it. So there's all this work that needs to be done beforehand before writing the first line of code um, uh, that makes sure that we are on the right path. And um, for solution architect, do you work with customers um, that are uh, different from different companies or do you work at, um, you know, at, for example, if you're working at Amazon, then you'll be building uh, solutions for uh, ar- uh, architecting the the the, the system uh, that are for products that are in Amazon. Like, um, right? What, what's what's the 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 res- you know the responsibility? Like, what kind of things that you know that you have to uh, face? You know, in your day to day job kind of thing. Right. So at AWS, as a solutions architect, I'm working with my customers are companies that use AWS. So the these customers or, the, or these companies, they have needs. Either they want to build a new application, either they want to migrate their old application from on-prem to the cloud, either they want to improve it to architect, to re-architect it, either they want to introduce a new technology. And so my responsibility is to accompany them from the beginning to have this advisor role, you know, from the beginning, uh, um, sit at the table and understand their requirements, gather it, gather them, and then provide my advice. That one of the responsibilities. The second responsibility is to actually design um, the solution. Once we got the, the stamp of approval, well, then, you know what? This is going to be the step one. This is going to be step two. This is going to be step three. So we provide solutions architects, provide this, hold this, you know, do this research uh, beforehand and then provide the necessary documentation uh, around the infrastructure, uh, around the uh, versioning, uh, around the um, technologies that need to be used, and also around post launch right uh, once once the production goes right. live what, what what are we going to do like how we are going to be monitoring our things how are we going to be scaling how are we expecting traffic burst how are we going to you know handle in that um so at AWS, you don't have the uh, uh, the possibility as a social architect at AWS. You don't have the possibility to touch customers' production environments, so you don't do the work for them in production, but you do all the work beforehand, right? And sometimes customers would reach out and say, "Hey, um, I've heard about this new service that AWS launched, and I want to know a little bit more about it, or I wonder where if API Gateway would be the good solution for." For my use case, or I'm having an issues with my SQL and I'm looking at Aurora MySQL, right? And and so another responsibility of a solutions architect is to um, uh, demystify these technologies and and also adapt one's uh, um, one's I would say language to the audience. Sometimes you're explaining the value proposition of the cloud to a CEO. You use a different language than you're talking with a developer, right? And sometimes the best way sure. to explain or or to showcase the value of a service is through a uh, presentation. Sometimes it's through a POC. Sometimes it's through uh, is through a voice call, a voice, you know, a, a phone call. And so this is pretty much the responsibility of a, of a solutions architect working at AWS. So there's a huge portion that is learning. You know, AWS has 200 plus services, ton of services, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so you always have to be up to date so you can advise your customers the best. And so 
pretty much every week I had to join a workshop. I had to join like there's at least three or four hours a week where we are where we were learning about these new technologies and new features. And AWS releases a ton of features for their services per week. So we had to be up to date about all these kind of things. So when a customer has a question, we're able to advise them and, and share with them the best solution that we can. Now at Essence, where I don't have external customers, I have actually internal yeah. customers. So it's, a, and these internal customers are different departments within the company. Their marketing department, uh, there's products department, there's department that takes care of shipping, there's a department that takes care of warehousing, uh, there's a different uh, department that takes care of building um, user experience. And so these different entities or domains within the company become my um, um, customers and I pretty much work with them the same way I work with external customers. So gathering their requirements, understanding their uh, 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 realities, their aspirations, their vision, understanding their roadmap, and then working with the developers of those departments on building, I, I see developers, but you know, uh, developers, team lead, UX designers, uh, products managers, and then being that that voice that helped them you, you know design and build this feature to be easily maintainable uh to be easily uh, um uh, uh what's the word i'm looking for extensible to be uh, easily updatable and to handle whatever requirements that business has so yeah it's just you know pretty much it's the same job it's just different stakeholders right right one is to the external one is to the internal pretty much right yeah got it 